Welcome in to Inside Carolina's Next Level, where, where Greg Barnes and myself discuss things a little deeper than normal every day covering college sports. Today, we have the one and only Aaron Fitt. Aaron joins us today to talk about North Carolina baseball in the NCAA tournament out in the Indiana State Regional. Greg Barnes, of course, is my co-host. Johnny T-Shirt is our sponsor. And Aaron, let's get right into it. Know you're a busy man this time of year. Uh, when these brackets were announced yesterday, um, what was your initial thought on Carolina getting not only shipped out to Indiana State, but as a three seed? I was I was a little surprised by the seed. You know, we, we had Carolina as, as a two, and really this committee did a great job, I think, with all of the other seeding. I mean, the, the whole tournament, and, and, and even this one, I think, is defensible. I mean, you know, Iowa felt like, had a very strong case for two seed. Also, we had them as a three. Um, so maybe this is kind of a case of your, your last two seed and your first three seed and kind of a coin toss either way, maybe they play each other. Uh, but uh, uh, slightly surprised that Carolina w- was, was a three. I mean, it's probably, you know, not the worst thing in the world to, to have them, you know, out on the road. One of those ACC triangle teams had to, had to go somewhere because, you know, they're just, you know, there were other ACC hosts in the area, but um, you could have sent somebody to Columbia and they sent NC State there. You could have sent somebody to Conway. They sent Duke there. You know, let, let's try something different. You know, Carolina gets to go out and, and play, I, I think, a, a vulnerable host as far as the, the, the numbers would tell you, you know, two and nine against the top 50 this year for Indiana. Indiana State, so maybe not the worst draw for, for North Carolina. Yeah, Aaron, I think the storyline this year, and it seems like it's been the, the storyline for a number of years, is really just how strong the SEC is from top to bottom. Uh, it really looked like to me, I wasn't necessarily worried with where they went. It was more of, okay, are they going to be shipped out somewhere in SEC country, which is going to be a tough draw opening weekend. They avoided that, um, which, which I think is a big benefit. Why do you think Indiana State – earned a one seed in a, in a regional host well, they, they had a great year you know and, and the bottom line is is you finish in the top 10 in the rpi and and you win your your regular season in conference tournament you're generally you're generally going to host you know even if the other metrics are light which is what happened here and you know they they were just fantastic after the first handful of, of weeks of the season you know i mean they, they played a, a tough non-conference schedule and hey when you're a, a cold weather team um it, it's always a little bit of a disadvantage coming out of the shoot. Although when you're playing against Northeastern, another cold weather team and you get swept in February, you don't really have that excuse. Uh, but, you know, they played Northeastern in Kentucky and, you know, Iowa early on and, and, you know, didn't do great, but really since the start of March, I mean, they've been, they've been fantastic. I think there's something like 32 and four or something down the stretch. Um, so just a very consistent team that, that pitches and plays defense very well and executes the inside game. And, um, you know, just a, just a rock solid fundamental baseball team. They're not going to terrify you with, with firepower or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they win, man. And yeah, I, I do think, you know, they were deserving of a host just, just based on the season that they had, I, you know, again, people will point to that two and nine top 50 and that's a legitimate criticism, but they were able to overcome that by just winning a lot and, and, and taking care of business in conference and in conference tournament. Before we focus, uh, purely on North Carolina, you mentioned this or kind of alluded to it in your opening comments, but how, how did you think the selection committee did on Monday? I know uh, it's, it seems like it's the fun thing to do, especially with March Madness is it's criticizing every little move but yeah. from a broad perspective. How do you think the committee fared? Well, you did pretty well, you know, probably a B plus for me. Um, it's uh, I, I objected to South Carolina hosting as an eighth sec team that really played like garbage the last, month, five weeks, six weeks. I mean, I think they lost their last four series and five of their last six and finished the year four and 11, you know, and, and you can make excuses for that and say it's injuries. Yeah. They had a lot of injuries, but the fact is they're not the same team now as they were when they were 30 and four, you know? And so I have a hard time justifying them as an, as an eighth host in that league um, when you've got other really strong candidates right there. And, you know, you can take Boston college, you can take Southern miss, you could take Dallas Baptist, you could take Campbell and, and Campbell's who we, we would have taken. We projected Campbell as that other host in our final projection. And, and so uh, we had Campbell hosting South Carolina instead it's going to be South Carolina hosting Campbell, which is I think an interesting subplot here, you know, Campbell with uh, a little bit of chip on their shoulder going down there against a wounded team. Um, 
you know, I think they're going to be pretty fired up for that one. And, and, and I like the way they played in, in Knoxville in front of a, a hostile crowd last year in, in the regional. Um, and, and I, I think this year it's going to be the same deal. They're going to go in there in front of a, a, a really boisterous crowd in, in Columbia. And, and I have a feeling they're going to elevate their game. That'll be interesting. Of course, we've got a Campbell pitcher. Um, that's a local kid, friend of the family and all. So I know they are fired up to go down there. Um, they don't get to go many big time places for an extended period of time. So they're going to have fun down in Columbia. But let me ask you the $64,000 question that everybody asks, and that's the RPI. You guys are heavy in it at D1. Um, people follow it. The tournament committee seemed like they followed it to the, to the letter for the top 16. Maybe I, I'm not looking at it directly. Um, but when it comes down to seeding, and I and granted, I agree with Coach what he Coach Forbes said. It's not really a big difference between two and three, other than being the home team um, or in a lower seed, and then potentially for next weekend. But what do you think about the RPI just in general? And then when it comes down to these metrics and these tournaments, um, because a lot of people wonder how in the world it works, and I've yet to hear um, folks satisfied with any explanation that they get. Yeah, I'm not, not a fan. And, you know, I just think for one thing, it's used way too heavily. And, and this year you saw it with the at-large teams. I mean, some of the choices that were made, you're taking teams that, that finished, you know, lower in the standings and lost the head-to-head matchup. It's like Oklahoma versus Kansas State. Kansas State swept them, you know, finished two or three games better in the standings. But Oklahoma had the better RPI, so they get the bid. I mean, it just felt lazy, you know. And, and the same goes for Arizona versus USC. Arizona finished five games behind USC in the standings. And still got the bid because they had the better RPI. It just, it just really, uh, I thought that was disappointing from the committee. So again, if I'm grading them, I gave them a B plus because I thought that, you know, they didn't pick any teams that were egregious. Arizona was a bubble team. They were one of our first four out. They put them in. That's not terrible. It's just that I have a hard time making a case for them over USC. But the big thing is, you know, we need to come up with a better system, whether it's tweaking the RPI formula or replacing it all together, like basketball did with the net. Um, you know, I, I just think that Cohen himself, John Cohen, the, the, the chairman committee, the Auburn AD, even said on the on the conference call yesterday, like, you know, the problem with the RPI is that, A, it's, it's advantageous to teams that play in the southeast. You know, that's been proven, um, especially when, when you're a road team uh, or a north a north. Uh, Northeast cold weather team that has to play on the road for the first six weeks. So you're like Boston college. I mean, you get some credit for playing road games, but it's still, you know, the way those things compound when you're in conference play and you're playing all these other teams that have, have beaten up, you know, competition at home for the rest of the season. I mean, there's a reason that those sec teams always have such gaudy RPIs probably because they win a lot of their games, 81% of their games out of conference. Uh, but you know, the, the thing is, we, we just need to come up with something better. And and I would love to see the committee move the ball forward on that, bring some some bright minds together. Uh, we need a system that doesn't incentivize you to cancel games. That's really the issue here is, you know, I don't blame teams. If you if you got, let's say, North Carolina A&T in your schedule in May, and you know that you can go out and win that game 20 to 1, and it's still going to hurt you in the RPI, why would you play the game? You know, you know what the criteria are. You know the committee leans on the RPI. And, and I hate that we're incentivizing teams to cancel games. Like, there, there shouldn't be a penalty for winning. Um, and, and, you know, you should be rewarded for playing a, a good schedule, sure, but we've got to find that balance. How do you do both? Yeah, that's a great point there. Of course, we know um, that that happened late in the season around here but it, when you're looking at north carolina specifically and we're talking about aaron fit d1 baseball here on next level uh north carolina's been up and down you know the, the nc state sweeps probably the highlight of the season i would think um clemson was rough but then in the acc tournament they sort of they showed me something against virginia uh, but then clemson was just a hot baseball team and kind of like you can't get out of the way of that mac truck how do you feel North Carolina's positioning is going into this tournament? Obviously, you've got Iowa on Friday night and then either Indiana State or Wright State. But do you feel good when you see North Carolina and you say that's a team that can make some noise in the NCAA tournament at this yeah. moment? Yeah, I, I walked away from that ACC tournament with kind of the same impression as you, Tom. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking – they look like they're, they're kind of rounding into shape again, you know, and it's funny to say that coming off a four game losing streak the week before um, you know, we know that they had a lot of players that had to miss time with that suspension thing with, they had to spread those guys out. That was a factor. And part of it was Clemson has been a steamroller, you know, I got swept down there. No shame really in that couple of close games, but um, I don't know. I, I liked, I like what I saw even without Vance Honeycutt for those first two games in the ACC tournament, I think is really encouraging that, 
Max Carlson is, is kind of rounding back into form at the right time. You know, obviously he's a key guy. Um, Jake Knapp, especially emerging, you know, throwing more strikes it, when he's in the zone, man. I mean, it's, it's real stuff. And uh, it feels like he's really turned a corner and he's got the confidence piece now. Um, you know, and, and th- now they've kind of got two guys that they can lean on. I really like the way the bullpen has come together. Um, I don't know how they're going to use Connor Bofair going forward. I think at this point you kind of have to just put him back in the bullpen where he was really good last year because uh, it's been a struggle for him starting of late. And so, you know, maybe they go to kind of an openers system. You try somebody else to open the game besides Bovair, you know, once you get to a third game in the weekend. Um, you don't need to have three horses in the rotation like you did in the old days. I mean, a lot of these teams, you know, you see the way Duke has built their staff. It's like one time through the order with a guy, if we can, and then we go to the bullpen, you know, and mix and match. And UNC, I think, has the depth to do that too. So uh, I, I do think this, guys, without Honeycutt this weekend, it'll be interesting. It's how, it sounds like Honeycutt's not going to play. Have you heard the same thing? I think that's what I was yeah, told. He's not playing. Yeah. Yep. So, so um, you know, I think they're good enough to win without him. You know, honestly, like Mac Horvath in center field, it's not as good as Vance Honeycutt. He's the best center fielder in the country defensively, but he can run. You know, he can he can handle himself out there. And their offense didn't look like a problem this week. You know, they, they still swung the bats really well. So you'd love to have Honeycutt. He's your most explosive player. But, boy, uh, Mac Horvath's pretty darn explosive too. Yeah, Aaron, it seems like for, for a long time there in the – last 20 years under Mike Fox, we were always talking about how elite of a pitching staff this Carolina team was. And when we got to this time of year, it was like, okay, they're a number one seed. So who do you throw on Friday? And in, in the, I guess the four seed uh, spilled a lot of ink over that conversation. Uh, different situation. Now, you, know, as you said, you nap and Carlson are kind of rounding in the form a little bit. This team really has relied on their, their bats more than anything. Uh, does that kind of allow for some, um, some free willing in terms of that, that first game against no. Iowa. And you, know, you can just kind of throw your guy out there, like you said, and, and hopefully it sticks and you can go to the bullpen if you need to. But right. at the end of the day, you're going to have to be able to score some runs. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I think they'll throw – I suspect they'll throw Carlson. You know, he's he's kind of their their bell cow guy with, with, with track record and postseason experience. Um, you know, he wasn't super sharp against Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech can really swing the bats. But, you know, four innings, one run, I mean – uh, I, I feel like I feel like you give him the ball, and and then if you need to make a move, you make a move. I mean, maybe Jake Knapp has, has kind of been their best guy lately. You know, maybe you you would go with him, but I, I'd rather I'd rather let him kind of you know spend a day kind of getting his feet under him, watching you know, getting used to the atmosphere since he's never done it before in this setting. And maybe you start with him on on Saturday. So uh, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Has, has he announced who's going to start? He said he told us on Monday at the Bosch. Um, either or, okay. it, depending on the matchup. Now, I'll talk to him later today. And for folks watching this, we're recording this Wednesday, or excuse me, is it Wednesday? No, it's Tuesday, Tuesday. afternoon. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. So I'll talk to Co- Coach Forbes later today and maybe he'll clarify. But he said it's going to be a matchup based deal, but those are certainly 1A and 1B. Yeah. But, yeah. but I will say that, I mean, Greg, to your point, the offense is, is very good. And I think the defense is very good too. That's maybe the underrated thing about this team. Um, we were wondering about, you know, shortstop without Danny Soretti. And, you know, Colby Wilkerson makes the plays. It's not, you know, sexy tools. Maybe it's not a premium arm, but he gets himself in position to make the throws. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I think actually Johnny Castagnazzi's defense at third base has been a pleasant surprise for me. Because, I mean, you know, range and quickness mobility has never really been his strength. But I think he's gotten better defensively from what I've seen. And it's and it's allowed them to put Horvath in the outfield, which has kind of, I think, made the whole lineup better. So the pieces, I feel like they, they've come together pretty well for this team. Um, and, again, you know, without hunting cut, it's a little different. But still really like the lineup and, and, and kind of like the, the makeup of this team. Just talking to the, the guys over the course of the season, it feels like they got a lot of, I would say, winning personalities on this team. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we've already talked about Indiana State. There is no guarantee that North Carolina is going to play Indiana State. So let's let's talk to you about the the team that they will for sure play, and that being Iowa. Uh, give us a give us a brief scouting report on, on what Iowa brings to the table. Yeah, talented team. Um, you know, you, you've got. Uh, I, I assume they'll probably start Brody Brecht in the opener. The the, the kind of fireballer. I mean, a guy that two sport guys freak athlete throws you know 98 100 miles an hour i mean I, I think it's it's a it's a big time power arm but you've also got ty langenberg that they could throw again i haven't seen who they've announced um but langenberg i mean i've seen him in the cape it was, 
it's really good. I mean, up to I think up to 95 for me with a really good breaking ball. And he pitched very well against Michigan last week in the conference tournament. So, um, you know, they, they've got a, a, a solid pitching staff, um, you know, not a, again, not a, a world beater kind of an offense, but they, they kind of just get the job done. You, you got a uh, Brennan Dere, Dere kid they got from Wofford as a grad transfer this year has been a really big time addition, kind of an on-base machine for him. Uh, I think he's kind of one of those guys that is, is, is the glue of the offense, makes them go a little bit. Uh, just a lot of quality of bats, you know, like all those, those Wofford guys, but um, you know, Sam Peterson, I mean, they, they've, they've got some, some guys that put the ball in play a little bit of juice. I mean, three guys with, with double digit homers, but that's not really the the strength of their offense. I, I do think that they're well suited for probably this, um, this, this setting. I don't think, I don't think the ballpark out there in Terre Haute is, is really a home run park. I've not been there. Um, that's a, it's a, oh, it's a blind spot for me, guys. I can't believe we've got a regional site. I haven't been to, I gotta, I gotta work on that. <laughs> Make the trip. Uh, yeah. It's in middle of nowhere, Indiana. Um, it's funny. We had a discussion with a couple of the players on Monday. Um, evidently there was a debate whether Larry Bird would be an all-star in this day and age amongst the players. So that hey, was quite interesting. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, and then I asked Castagnazzi, I was like, wait a minute, when were you born? And he was like, he said, 2002. Oh, okay. Have, have you guys ever seen the photo of Bird in an Indiana State baseball uniform? I have not. I have, big, yes. big old, you know, dip in his, in his cheek or whatever. And he's just like, it's a classic 70s photo. It is, it is epic. He like, there was like a bet or something. Um, and he went out and played a baseball game. And, and I don't think the basketball coach loved it. But, uh, so that is awesome. I can't remember how he performed, but I mean, it's one of those great '70s sports stories. You got to love that stuff. Yeah, it was cool. It, it's cool, and it sort of ropes me back in when I'm like, these these guys are young. They never saw them play, and like, I think Adam Smith asked him, "What about Patrick Ewan playing for the for the Knicks?" Asked Castagnazzi, and he's like, "Yeah, I didn't see him play either." I mean, it's like, what are we doing here <laughs> anyway? Circling back uh, to North Carolina baseball, we're talking with Aaron Fit, Aaron. Overall, um, you've watched a ton of baseball. Let's talk about Matt Horvath and Tomas Frick. Um, clearly, they're the leaders of this team. Horvath uh, probably gets a lot more ink, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. But Frick has really, really been good of late. Just what have you seen from him that he's really stepped up his game, both on the field and at the plate? Yeah, he's, I'll tell you, you're right. I mean, and there's a reason it feels like Frick's at every press conference. It's like, he's kind of the, he, he's the, he's the leader and he's just, he's, you know, he's so thoughtful. Um, he's really got a, a, a unique presence about him and you love to have that, of course, at that position. But I, I've thought really all year long, even since the fall that he looked trimmer than he has in the past and more, a little more athletic. Um, and, and I feel like his, his approach is, is a lot improved. Um, you know, he, he's using the whole field. He, he's taking pitches. He's, he's, he's hitting the ball with authority. I mean, really it's uh, uh, his evolution as an offensive player has been, has been so impressive and, you know, certainly he's rock solid behind the plate. He's kind of your general back there, but um, I, I did not expect this would be a guy that would be hitting cleanup for, for North Carolina in his career, you know, I mean, he just felt like kind of a nice, nice piece just stick down in the lineup, you know, when he was a freshman or something, but uh, he's really, he's really developed, you know, and give him credit, um, give the coaching staff credits. It's a, a fantastic, I think, developmental success story for him. Indeed it is. He's been great at the plate. And like you said, and like we've said that the leadership from the catcher position is something every team needs. And he's, he's given it to him, especially given North Carolina's sort of uneven pitching at times. That is Aaron fit D one baseball. Aaron, we're going to cut you loose. I know it's a hectic time of year for you and the guys over there, but we appreciate you joining Greg and I. Yeah. Always a pleasure guys. Enjoy the, enjoy the postseason. Yeah. Thank you. Aaron. Take care and be safe, safe travels. Get to Terre Haute. See yeah, I'll work, I'll work on that. Is there a direct <laughs> flight from uh, from RDU to Terre Haute? Probably, right? No, there's not. No. <laughs> not anybody's flight we can afford. I appreciate it, my man. Take care. All right, you too. Greg, it's always fun to talk to those guys, and Aaron's one of the one of the good guys, and in, is in really dialed into baseball. It's interesting, you know, college baseball. I don't think gets enough recognition, especially because it starts in the heart of basketball season. But it seems to ramp up this time of year. And quite frankly, I've always been a baseball guy. I'm a baseball, football, and then basketball. You've covered a ton of North Carolina baseball over the years. Um, what do you think about this team and their postseason chances here going out to Indiana to play in this regional? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, talking there with, with Fit, um, for so long, especially when I started covering the team back in 
I guess the, the early aughts, uh, it was all about pitching for North Carolina. And then, of course, you got into that that College World Series run from 06 to 09, and you had great pitching, and then you had some elite hitting with Ackley and Seager and, and those guys, FedEx. Um, and those were just elite dominant teams. And uh, you kind of take it for granted when you see it because it's like, you know, they're beating teams 11 to 1, 12, and 12 to 1 in, in regional play, which is just crazy. Uh, this is not that team. And I, I think I think anybody who's followed this team understands that for North Carolina to kind of get back to where they want to be as a uh, a top eight seed, a team expected to make it to the College World Series in Omaha, they're going to have to do a little bit better job in terms of, of recruiting, whether that be through the portal or or you know in the high school ranks. But what this group is, and, and fit hit on it there, it, Scott Forbes and Mike Fox have always done a good job of, of recruiting leadership guys and good chemistry guys in the locker room good locker room guys, right? Clubhouse guys. Uh, and that's what this team has a lot of. And so they, they play for each other. Um, is it always the prettiest thing? No, it's not. Uh, but they're gritty. They battle. Uh, you know, sometimes they've won with their arms. Sometimes they've won with the bat. Sometimes they've won in defense. And that's what's going to have to happen. They're going to need some solid performances on the mound. I think that for me, that's really the, the key thing this weekend. Because if, if Carlson goes out there and Knapp goes out there and they only last a couple innings, Forget it. But if you can get some some deep pushes into the game, you know, fifth, sixth inning would be fantastic. Now all of a sudden your your bullpen's in good shape and you can you can handle some things because if that doesn't happen, uh, the bats really have to come through and you cannot get into the losers bracket because this is so difficult if you don't have a long and deep pitching staff uh, to battle your way out of the losers bracket. Carolina's done it before, but it is really difficult. And so I really think it starts with the the pitching staff being able to go deep, the starters, and uh, you know, without having Honeycutt out there, you know, defensively and of course at the plate, um, that makes it even more important. Yeah, I've always told people that watch these double elimination regionals, or even at Omaha, or back when the ACC tournament was a double elimination thing, you have to win both games, the first two games. It doesn't matter which game you lose, but if you don't go two and zero. Oh, um, out of the gate and these things that you, you're behind the eight ball. And to your point, you're going to use a ton of pitching. And North Carolina's got it. Scott Forbes has relied on primarily eight guys. And he said leading up to this tournament, it's going to be Carlson, Knapp, Knapp, Carlson, and TBA, unlikely on any third game. Well, you get in the loser's bracket and you add another game, at least one more. So for North Carolina to get there, let me ask you this as well. And then we'll get out of here. And you're listening to the next level sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt. And, of course, we had Aaron Fitt just a moment ago. And I didn't ask him because I didn't want to put him on the spot. But Matt Horvath, first 2020 guy in the ACC since 1999, Florida State player, not first team all ACC. That kind of struck me. And then I started thinking, well, what position does he play? Because he's been at right. He's been in third. He's been at in center now. Um a, do you think that hurt him in that? And B, do you think that maybe he was shafted a little bit? Yeah, for sure. All of the above, um, especially when you have a guy like Honeycutt who takes all the headlines for a North Carolina team. And it's not like Carolina you know, has, has had the publicity of a Clemson with their late charge, right? Or Virginia or Wake Forest, which is the number one seed in the country. There's a lot of good teams in the, in the ACC. And so because of that, you know, the, the guys and the teams that, that play the best uh, in, in prime time and get all the national headlines, they're the ones that are going to get the attention. I um, mean, we see it in basketball some where, where you know, players for teams that, that maybe aren't top four or five in the, in the conference, some of those guys do get a little bit shafted. Um, and that, that's one of the difficult things when you're, when you're voting. There's only so many people you can go uh, and vote for. And then you have to say, okay, well, how much do you value – their role in a team that has a lot of success as compared to you know, a little bit better than average success. And so I think there's a lot of different components into that. Uh, phenomenal year though, Tommy, there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, but before we get out of here, uh, I, I thought about this after fit checked out fit and Kendall Rogers got together. I don't even know how long ago this was. Uh, but they, they came together and formed D1 Baseball. Let me give you a little bit of backstory because I think this is fascinating. This is one of the creative things about college baseball. Back in the day when, when I was going out to Omaha covering the baseball team, Kendall Rogers was working for Perfect Game. 
fit was with John Manuel at Baseball America. And those were the college guys. And so whenever uh, you know, the College World Series was being held, those two individuals went out there and they were like kind of the, the voices, almost kind of competing because everybody said, well, Kendall knows a lot, Aaron knows a lot. <laughs> uh, and there was a number of times where I would join them um, at a little pizza place down in the old market uh, in, in Omaha, which is a great section. If you, you ever get a chance to go out to Omaha for College World Series, highly recommend it. It's fantastic. Even though you know, they're no longer at Rosenblatt, they're actually closer to the old market, which is a really cool entertainment area. Um, I never had the conversation with them, but I can only imagine that those two guys are sitting around after ball games, eating pizza, or, you know, having a beer or Coke or whatever, and brainstorming, hey, w- what can we do to take this coverage of college baseball to the next level? At the time, D1 baseball was strictly running scores. So if you needed access to scores across college baseball, that's where you went. That's pretty much all they had. Uh, and so there was a, a great collaboration with FIT and with uh, Kendall and D1 Baseball to come together and form what they have now, which is, uh, I think it's just a, a fantastic website for college baseball. The content they put out this week, uh, especially the regional previews, is some of the best baseball content you will see all year. And so I highly recommend that uh, to people who just love college baseball. I just think that's that kind of thing, Tommy, is just a uh, – you, it's got very organic how it comes about. There's always a cool story at the backside of it. But for those guys to do what they've done, I think is really impressive. And uh, just kind of knowing where they started from 20 years ago, it makes it makes it pretty cool. Yeah, I, I remember picking up Baseball America magazines um, back in the day and, and reading about it because it was really the only place you could get stuff. And, yeah. and to your point now, D1's done a great job doing it. So if you listen to this, check out D1 Baseball. Check out Adam Smith's articles and stuff on Inside Carolina on the Diamond Hills message board. And, of course, check out all of our stuff. We'll have Scott Forbes posted as well. So if you're watching this video and you had not ch- checked out Scott's – or, excuse me, Coach Forbes's discussion from today on Tuesday, check that out as well. Greg Barnes does not cover the beat. Will not be in Omaha if North Carolina is. But Greg Barnes always on top of everything here at Inside Carolina. Greg – Another successful next level, my friend. Yep. Thanks for setting it up, Tommy. Yep. Talk to y'all soon. Johnny T-shirt and Johnny T-shirt.com. Got a show idea for next level? Hit me up or hit Greg up. Let us know. We'll be knocking them out all summer. We got plenty to, plenty to bring you, but we also want to uh, give you what you want as well. So let us know what you want, what you need. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody, for listening. <laughs>